uh, have the pleasure to uh, receive uh, Miles. Uh, so he will talk about, uh, which is a nice complement to the lecture that you had in the morning. He'll talk about uh, tensor networks for machine learning applications. Thanks, Miles. Hi, I'm Miles. Um, glad to be here with you all. Um, so I'm going to be telling you today and tomorrow morning about tensor networks for machine learning applications. Um, so you know you've, you've been hearing about um, neural networks, and they're something that came up in the machine learning field, and have been making their way more and more into physics applications. So these talks will be about sort of the uh, complementary activity, which is that tools mostly from quantum physics, quantum minibody physics. Um, having some you know, chance or some opportunity to make their way into broader fields, machine learning and um, other areas of the sciences that I'll, I'll probably touch on tomorrow, things like solving differential equations or um, optimizing uh, functions, things like that. So um, that's what it'll be about. Um, let me briefly tell you a little bit about um, where I'm coming from. So I work at a place called the Flatiron Institute. I thought I would just flash one slide about that. Um, so Flatiron, we're located in New York City, so right in Manhattan. And we're kind of unique in a certain way, which is that we, our focus is on um, computing and computational sciences. So you can see all of our centers have the word computational in the name somewhere, so they all have the letter C somewhere in them. And we, we cover a lot of areas by now. We started out with just uh, four centers, but now we have quite a bit more. So we have um, a center doing astrophysics, biology. I'm in the one for quantum physics, and there's some people here from that center attending. There's also um, computational mathematics, and then the newer ones are neuroscience, and then this new thing called the Initiative for Computational Catalysis. So that one's really new. They're actually hiring postdocs and uh, faculty right now at ICC, and it's gonna be like a half size center for 10 years doing quantum chemistry and applications to catalysis. So some of you may be interested to, to learn more about that. Um, so let me start by talking about what am I gonna cover today and tomorrow. So today, I'll go through the basics of tensor networks. What are tensors? What are tensor networks? And then some kind of uh, you know, uh, broad introduction to how I could see them being used in machine learning and how they're starting to be used in machine learning and what the potential is, what are some of the drawbacks of the current approaches right now. Because it's not, as of right now, it's not as broadly um, applicable as, say, neural networks to all kinds of data. It's a bit more niche. So we'll kind of unpack a little bit why. Um, but then tomorrow, I'm going to talk, I'm going to challenge you all a little bit tomorrow by going really deep into two algorithms for training tensor networks, um, in one case from data, and in the other case from a function that you can call, that the, the, the machine learning algorithm is able to call. So we'll see some really novel things. For example, neither algorithm will have a gradient in it anywhere. So there's no gradient descent in these algorithms. It's all linear algebra. That's one novel thing. The other novel thing is that that second algorithm, the one here at the bottom called the tensor cross interpolation algorithm, there's no data. So it's, it's more like reinforcement learning where you just have the ability to like explore an environment. In that case, the environment is like a function, like a piece of code that the algorithm can call. And it's able to query this function or code and learn the whole, it's able to learn all the outputs of the function just from a few. So that's called like active learning type of idea. So we'll get into those more tomorrow. Today is gonna to be a bit more broad. Um, I wanted to start, too, by asking how many of you have heard of a tensor network before? Okay, that's most of you, right? Um, what do you associate those with um, when you hear about tensor networks? What are some concepts that you are familiar with? Did you say DMRG? Yeah, I think someone said that. That's, the, that's like the algorithm that really launched that field. What are some other concepts you may have heard about Low rank approximation, very good, yeah. That's a very good like mathematical way to, to place tensor networks, right? So that's really what they are. They, a lot of people think of them as wave functions, that's how I learned them. But really they're a mathematical technique based on low rank approximation for working in high dimensional spaces. So that's what today is gonna be about. And then um, just to convince you that this is a real thing, that I'm not just talking about just only concepts, let me kind of give you a quick sneak, uh, sneak preview of what is gonna be the last talk tomorrow and this algorithm called tensor cross interpolation. And let me just show you this demo of what that algorithm can do, and then I'll explain in the second lecture tomorrow how it works. So what this algorithm can do is, one of the things it can do is you can give it some function, like a piece of code for a pretty complicated function, and it can machine learn it into a tensor network. And I'll tell you in a minute what is a tensor network and what this diagram means. But for now, just think of it as some kind of architecture with parameters. Um, so here's the function, it's 40 Gaussians, Here's the Gaussians um, in random locations, uh, random widths, 
and random heights that can be positive or negative, and then just for good measure, a sharp step at the location x equals 0.4, so just some big step as well. So kind of a hard or complicated-ish function, right? And let's see what we can do. So here's, here's the code for that. Um, nothing too special. This is in the Julia language. So this is just saying uh, 40 Gaussians. Here's the width. Make random widths and heights as, as arrays. Here's the step information. Make a function that, that evaluates that function at points. And then throw it into this tensor cross interpolation code, which for now is just a black box. And um, here's the code running. It already ran. That was how fast that went. Um, and there's the function. So the function is the thin lines. Um, the actual function just evaluated on every possible point is these thin lines. And then these blue points are where the TCI algorithm evaluated the function. And you can see that some places it evaluates more densely and some places more finely. And it does look like a lot of points, but there's some statistics here. It says that um, on the last pass over the 1D space, it only did um, something like 1,300 queries of the function versus the potential 262,000 grid points that the function is living on. Is in, once it's represented as a tensor network, that's how many grid points you can actually ask for the value of. So it was able to fill in that many grid points just by evaluating the function about 1,000 times. That's only about um, half a percent of the possible points. So we can do this again. It's just generating a random function each time. Okay, so there it learned that function too. And you can see there's this sharp step and it has no problem with that either. Okay. So that's just a quick demo of what some of these algorithms can do, just to give you a feel of the power of, of them. Okay, great. So let's start, though, at the beginning about tensors and tensor networks, and then why do I think personally that tensor networks have some promise for machine learning and could be quite interesting? And today I'll use the inspiration of the DMRG algorithm for that. And then I'll end today by discussing um, two really contrasting ways to represent data as tensors and the advantages and disadvantages or the, the potential of each of those ways. One I'm calling a high dimensional, one low dimensional, and they're both very interesting. And then some example applications of what has been done so far and a bit of a setup for tomorrow. Okay, so what is a tensor, first of all, starting at the basics, right? So um, you may have heard a lot of things about tensors, things say, people will write an expression that has a lot of indices, but then they'll say, but it's not a tensor, and then you're thinking, I thought it was, because I see a lot of indices, what's going on? You know, so especially if you've studied GR, this, people like to say a lot of things, or not everything is a tensor, you know. Or, or you'll, you'll say, here's a tensor, and you'll show someone some data, and they'll say, no, a tensor is not that, it's how it transforms. You probably have heard that. Right. These are all true statements, but the problem is um, they're kind of usually overcomplicating the story. The point is once you have a basis and you, you know what basis you're in, then in a basis a tensor can be represented as a multidimensional array. So as long as you know what basis the, these, these numbers refer to, that's a tensor. Um, so in this point of view, in a very practical kind of engineer point of view, a tensor is just an extension of the idea of a vector or a matrix up to higher dimensions. So a vector is a one-dimensional array of numbers, a matrix is a two-dimensional array of numbers. We can talk about the components. We can say the second component of the vector V is the number three, or the one, two component of this matrix here is seven, and so on. An order three tensor would have three dimensions, right? But you can see it's impractical, even for order three, to try to view this as this multidimensional array. You can't really write it. It's sort of, you have to use 3D drawings or 4D drawings. Order four would already be very hard to draw this way. Um, so a much better notation was invented by um, Roger Penrose, and it's called Penrose Diagram Notation. It may look like neural network notation, where there are circles and lines connected, but it's actually, it's sort of related, but, but very different in an important way. So with neural networks, when you see the lines, um, each of those lines is the entry of a matrix. Um, here the lines are indices. The other difference is that here, when you put things next to each other, they're implicitly in a product with each other. Whereas in a neural network, when you put them next to each other, they're more in a direct sum with each other. So this, this um, notation is sort of exponentially higher dimensional what it's expressing. But you can still kind of roughly see them as related if you know at least how to kind of think about lifting direct sums to direct products. So, um, that's just a bit of theory. But more practically, um, the idea is that in traditional math, you'll see a tensor notated as a letter with a bunch of indices. And what you do in the diagram notation is you, you replace the letter by a shape and the indices become these lines. And even though you can put the names of the indices, you don't have to. And that's very nice because you can just express ideas by saying this is connected to that without having to think of names for everything and having subscripts and then sometimes subscripts with subscripts, right? It can get very heavy in traditional math. So um, to give you some examples of this notation, um, for low order tensors, a vector is a shape with one line. A scalar would just be a shape with no lines. Um, 
A matrix is a shape with two lines coming out. The order, the orientation doesn't matter for most applications. So you just put the lines coming out whichever direction you want. Order three tensor has three lines and you can already see the advantage. Instead of having to make a cube of numbers, you can just draw three lines coming out. So you can, you can easily do order four, you just have four lines. You can do order n with n lines. Um, so you should think of these shapes as um, like a trunk full of numbers and you can reach in the trunk and pull out a number and they're all kind of in there or like a cauldron and all the numbers are just in there and you can reach in and access any of those numbers, right? So if you want to notate how do you get a particular number, so this kind of one, two, two component of this tensor T, you can just think of setting the lines temporarily to fixed values. So you set this line to one, this, these lines to two, and then out comes the number seven, which is in that, in that array or that tensor. And then the main rule of this notation, the main other rule, is kind of like going one step beyond Einstein summation notation, which is that when you join the indices, there's a contraction, like a sum is running over this, this index line. So on the right is the tra traditional math notation. We say there's this matrix with two indices, i and j. They're summed over index j, so you can see j is connecting to j here. Then j is gone, it's, out, it's done from the sum. i carries over to the other side, and we see that m times v equals w. On the left, that's the exact same expression. Just here, I've dropped all the letters, but and you can still see what's going on. So you can see here's a thing with two indices connecting to something with one, and then what's left over still has this dangling index on the left. So what's nice about this notation also, I did, first of all, you don't have to think of the letters, but also you can do these kind of visual proofs. So you can see that even if you didn't know about a matrix or a vector, you could just see that the result has one line left over. So it's nice to just visualize what's going on. So for example, you can see that the next expression is a scalar because there's no lines left over, right? So you, again, these kind of visual proofs. Or the last one is a vector, right? One line left over. And then here's the traditional notation for these. And that's, that's pretty nice in this case, but I kind of like this left hand side better. Um, and again, you don't have to think of all these, these letter names. So this really pays off when you work with tensor networks. It's not so important for small things like this, but when you really have a lot of tensors, it saves you a lot um, of writing. And I find it more intuitive to see like the topology of the network, how things are connected, um, and it's just more intuitive. So on the right is the um, traditional notation for what's called a matrix product state or tensor train tensor network, which I'll introduce in some more depth in a minute. And, if you, and there's a lot of papers where you'll only see this expression for it, especially from the applied math literature. And you know, when you see that for the first time, at least to me, it's not so obvious what's going on. You really have to stare at it a while and kind of locate names of indices and think about how they're connected. Whereas on the left, you just see it immediately. It's a chain of tensors. Each one has three indices. They have a linear or tree-like tree topology. Tree in the sense that there's no loops. It's just a, a chain, right? OK, so now's a chance to um, test whether you got the last two slides. So, um, just think for a minute about how, in your own words, would you describe each of these three operations? So let's start with this one. What's the kind of typical math name for this operation, right? Does someone want to say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, dot product or inner product, right? So we have two vectors, two things with one index each. That index is summed over, so it's v dot w. It's a vector inner product. Okay. How about someone else want to say what's the second one? Okay. Yeah, trace of a matrix, right? So it's a matrix because it has two indices. That index is summed over. You can see the result as a scalar because there's no dangling indices. Great. Okay, and then someone else for the last one. This one doesn't have like a actual common name, but just sort of in words, how would you describe what operation is going on? Let's see, yeah, in the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, contraction with a rank three or order three tensor with a vector. Great. Yeah, I, I typically say order three these days because um, uh, rank is also used to mean when a matrix has like, could be factorized with a smaller sum in the middle. But a lot of people say rank for a number, number of indices, so it's perfectly fine. Exactly. So order three tensor with a vector. Exactly. And you can see it's pretty heavy, these notations on the right. And on the left, you can write the letters if it helps, but you can leave it off if it, if it helps also. Okay, great. Um, so now kind of pushing ahead into tensor networks, one last thing about tensors um, is that um, any function of discrete variables can be represented as a tensor, right? And I think, and that's in a way just kind of a very straightforward and obvious statement because you could just take the function, you can just set all the variables going in. Imagine these are discrete integer variables like S1 through S6 each run over D integer values or maybe listing two values, you know, one and two, one and two, one and two. Um, and all you do is you just plug in all possible values into the function and just put them in this tensor. So just fill up this array with all the outputs of F Right? And clearly it can represent that function. And that would just be true for any function whatsoever. And so I wanted to point this out to say that there's no nonlinearities here. 
right? And yet, it can represent any function whatsoever. So I'm gonna make this point a few times a few different ways, that even though if, if you know neural networks, you hear very often that, um, that you only have a powerful function approximator when you have nonlinearities. Here you have none, and yet you can represent any function at all. However, you pay an exponential price in this form. We'll see how to break that exponential later. Okay, yes. Oh, how to do continuous variables? Yeah, I'll, t I'll show you a really neat, neat way to do that later, exactly so. But for now, if you just did a continuous variable, um, one way to do it that people actually do is they just finally discretize the variable. But that, as you might imagine, is kind of inefficient. You might take a, let's say if S1 was continuous, or call it X1, then you might chop that, let's say it goes from zero to one, you might chop it into 100 uh, uh, steps. And so then you would have a 100 dimensional index. And people do that, and you can do that. However, 100 is a lot, and especially if you have three or four such indices, then it's gonna be 100 to the four numbers inside. Um, and also, you have a grid approximation, which may not be so good of an approximation. So another thing you can do is you can attach a basis. You could use a basis of functions, and that could work better. You could also, just mathematically, you could just say, I'm not worried about cost. I just want that to be continuous, and that's okay, and you can prove a lot of things, but, but I'm often thinking about how do you store it on a computer. So we'll see toward the end of the talk um, that an, a really neat thing you can do is you can use groups of indices to represent the bits of a number, and this is like an exponentially efficient way of inputting a continuous variable. So use collections of indices. Um, this is the idea called quantics tensors or quantics tensor trains that some, some of you may have heard of, but I'll, I'll introduce that. So here's, um, so it's a, it's a really good question. We can discuss more. Um, here's just me running through a more intuitive picture of what is it like to fill up a tensor with all the values of a function. So just imagine, you know, we run over all the values of the function, all exponentially many, and fill them in. Okay, great. Um, what are some examples of big tensors, or where do tensors pop up? And, and one argument I would make is that they're actually everywhere once you start looking for them. One example is quantum many-body physics, or quantum computing also. Um, anytime you have a many-body state that you, you can't represent using tricks like Clifford tricks or free fermion tricks, once you're really faced with the full many-body um, Hilbert space, then the general wave function actually is a big tensor. And it's, it's very straightforward to see. You pick a basis, so let's say these are qubits, or they could be spin a halves. So each index S just runs over two values, say zero or one. Then all the information about, so the basis is just picked. All the information about the state is in the amplitudes, the coefficients in front. That's all the information right there. And then just by inspection, you can see some numbers that are indexed by a bunch of integers. That's a tensor, right? So every many-body wave function is a big tensor, whether you like tensors or not. Um, so if you're doing quantum mechanics, tensors are there. Um, so we saw, you know, general, general functions of many discrete variables, general wave functions, right, they're kind of everywhere. Um, but why are they challenging to work with? Why do we need tools like tensor networks? Why don't we just, you know, work directly with tensors? Um, there's a very simple reason. It's called the curse of dimensionality in math, and in physics we call it the many-body problem. And um, it's just that the parameters grow too fast. So if you have a vector with a size, let's say all these indices are size two. If you have a vector with a size two index, two parameters, you know, two, uh, you get a matrix, four parameters, three index tensor, eight parameters. But once you go to n um, indices, so think of like a wave function with n sight, something like that, two to the n parameters. So if you have 50 indices, you'd have this many parameters, which is about 10 to the 15. So it's, it's really hopeless, right? We can't store tensors with way too many indices. Maybe up to 10 is okay, 20, but after that, it's really impossible. Um, so there are some ways out of this, though. There's quite a few, and I'll focus on the last one especially. Uh, one way, there's a whole field, in fact, of people that study sparse tensors. So you could say, what if we only know some of the entries? Like maybe we just collect some entries in, in, in the sense of collecting data. Or maybe most of the entries really are zero. That's one way out, is to do sparsity. Another one is to say, maybe they're all non-zero, but I'll just pick the most important ones more often than the less important ones, so you can do sampling, right? That's another way out. But I, I think the most interesting, personally, is low rank structure, and I'll unpack that quite a bit here in a minute, what I mean by low rank structure. So for the case of a matrix, finding low rank structure is basically a, an elegantly solved uh, problem. Although there's many different ways to solve it, we'll see a really neat one in the third lecture. Um, but the most kind of fundamental way to solve it is to compute what's called the singular value decomposition of a matrix. So first of all, low rank, um, what that means is you have some matrix M, and I'm being not too specific here, and then you say, what if we could factorize it into two other matrices where the outer dimensions are the same as M? They have to be the same, right? These big dimensions. But this inner index that gets introduced between them, what if it's small? Like what if it's just two or four? 
whereas the outer dimension could be 1,000, right? That's what's meant by low rank, is that small inner index. Um, so actually finding this, finding the most optimal A and B with the smallest R is a solved problem, solved by singular value decomposition. So let's see how, kind of how singular value decomposition works. I'm not gonna go through the algorithm for how you actually compute it, but just kind of show, show you what it gives you when you run it on the computer. So you, you get some matrix, and here you may see there's already some structure in this matrix, like some numbers are repeating, two, these two columns look kind of related to each other. So we already have some, some intuition from that that there might be low rank structure. So we call the SVD, basically it squares the matrix on both sides, computes eigenvalue decomposition of both of those, and then puts it all back together if you wanna know kind of how it works. There's other ways to do it. Um, and when all, when all that's done and the dust settles, you get three matrices out. You get U on the left, V on the right, and then S in the middle. And the idea is that um, U and V have orthonormal columns. So it, when they're square, they're unitary. And then um, the S matrix is diagonal, and it's called, these numbers are called singular values, and they can always, without loss of generality, even with complex numbers um, in, the, in the original matrix, to be chosen real, non-negative, and decreasing. So it's really nice, because it kind of, it's kind of ranking the columns of U and the columns of V, and saying the most important, second most important, third most important, and tells you by how much, and then gives you some sense of you know, how much they're each contributing to the left and right spaces of the matrix. And what's neat about this um, decomposition is that it lets you do a controlled approximation. So you can first take it exactly, and then you can say, here's, I'm showing at the bottom the error from the original matrix to this reconstructed one. So, so, so far, we just do the SVD and multiply it back, and there's no error. But what if we throw away the smallest singular value? This is the matrix that you get. Basically, that just gets rid of the third column in this, in this example. What you can do is you can collect the singular values that you throw away and add up their squares. And when you add up their squares, it actually gives you an error report of how far away the reconstructed matrix is gonna be from the original one. So it's like a controlled thing you can do, throw away the smallest ones, collect the error you made, and you, it's a controlled method where you know how much error you're making. Um, and then you know, throw away the next one and you see that the error is exactly, again, given by the sums of squares the singular values you throw away. And then what's the point of throwing them away? What's nice about this is now this whole block down here is zero. So these zeros multiply into V into U. So we don't need those parts of V and U anymore. We can just keep only the columns corresponding to the singular values that we keep. Sometimes also the singular values may actually just be zero and those you can just throw away immediately. Others are small and then you throw them away but you, you know you're making an approximation, right? And so when you've done this, um, you get these smaller matrices, and now everywhere you used to have M, you can use these smaller matrices, so you have less memory you use, your code runs faster, that's, that's what's nice about it. Also, you can get insights, it's more interpretable, all these kind of benefits. Um, so when you've done this, how is that related to what I said on the other slide? So if singular value decomposition spits out three matrices, and if you wanna go back to this structure of two, one way to do that is just square root the S matrix and put it into U and V, and you can call that A and B. So all I'm saying on this slide is that if you wanna think of low rank as factorizing into two matrices, SVD also solves that by just push S into one or the other or symmetrically into both. Okay, any questions about SVD and about low rank? That's kind of important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good question, so it's, um, if it's square, it's just the cube of the linear dimension of the matrix, but let's say, um, let's say the matrix is uh, M by N. The complexity is actually min of M N squared and um, M squared N. So this is a nice thing about it. So if they're the same or close to the same, it's just the cube. Of, of M, you know. But if they're different, you can pick the smaller of the two. So say that N is really big, um, then the complexity will be this one, the, the dominant complexity. And so it could be 10 by 1,000, and it'll only scale linearly in this one, which is nice, times some, some overhead of 10 squared. So it's a good. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Great, okay. Um, so then, okay, I already mentioned how if you can factorize, do a low rank factorization of a matrix. So SVD is just one way. There's other ways, but SVD has some kind of provably optimalness to it that we can discuss. Um, but let's just say you have some way of doing a low rank decomposition of a matrix. That is nice because it reduces your memory footprint and your compute cost. Um, and now for the rest of the talk, when I mention the rank, I'm not gonna call it R, but I'm gonna call it chi, because that's what's more standard these days in the matrix product state and tensor train literature. So that's the picture for a matrix. Okay, but so much for matrices, that's a solved problem. What about for tensors? Can, what can we do there? Can we find low rank 
decompositions. And now there's a whole zoo of possibilities, actually. So there's whole other types of low rank properties of tensors that I'm not even going to touch on or barely mention. There's one called canonical polyadic, and there's like a whole subfield of people studying that one. There's many others. There's Tucker, these kind of things. I'm going to be talking about um, matrix product states almost exclusively in these talks. Um, and so how do they work? The idea is that they're more opinionated about um, the order of the indices. Some, some, like CP, low rank, tries to keep the indices symmetric. But MPS and TensorTrain is saying we either guess an ordering of the indices or we already know an ordering in, of the indices. Sometimes we know a good one. Like there might be some spatial structure in space or in time, things like that. So we can do the following procedure. We could say, let's think of this huge tensor as a matrix that's very lopsided, right? So we'll put one index on the left, okay? And all the other indices on the right and make some big, very rectangular matrix, right? It might be like two by two to the n minus one matrix, right? We can always do that. It's like in Python, if you just call reshape, you could do that to a big tensor. Um, then we can, we can throw that really big matrix into the SVD, and out comes U, S, and V, and we can keep U out on the left and do a low rank factorization. Then we can keep U behind, and then we can cut again here, and we can say, take the result of that and do another SVD, but grouping the indices differently this time and then do another and do another and do another. Every time we see this leftover tensor down here, we can always cut um, and then reveal another bond like that, okay? So that's a very quick, kind of lightning quick introduction to how that works. I didn't go through all the algorithmic steps. But that's just kind of a motivating algorithm for what a matrix product state is. So we call this thing at the bottom, once we've done that, we call this form a matrix product state. And in the math community, they call this same idea tensor train. Kind of tensor train is really a better, more general name, right? It's like a train where the carriages are our tensors. That's really where they got that name. Um, so any questions about what I mean there, like that process? We're not gonna use that algorithm, but it's just more of a motivating idea of why this could be a good form to approximate a tensor. Okay, great. So the idea is that you think about doing this if you want to motivate why this could be a good form. But in practice, what you do is you just start more or less with this form. So you say, we imagine some big tensor that's so big we could never store it, and we, we don't have access to the whole thing, right? Like remember I said big tensors could have something like two to the, 10 to the 15 numbers inside. So we imagine it, but we don't really ever work with tensors that big. What we do is we try to approximate them in some form. So we just write down an approximation that's motivated somehow, and this is a particularly good one in many cases. And the approximation is that every external index of the original tensor goes on to just one of these smaller core tensors, and each of these has three indices. Yes? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, um, yes, that's, that's the case, yeah. So you can prove that um, that if this form exists, that you can always find the, the optimal uh, ranks, the optimal chi. So if, if I took um, some, like one way to um, think about that is if I took this form at the bottom and I put you know, random numbers into it, but I chose these chi's to be small, like say I choose them all to be four or something like that, then I just mash all these tensors back together. I just contract them all back together to get this big tensor above. And then I don't tell you how I made the numbers. You know, I just give you that, those numbers. Then I, then I run this process, and I go and do these SVDs from left to right. It actually will give me each time four, 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 four. It'll rediscover those ranks again. Mm -hmm. Thanks, yeah, good question. Yeah, any other questions about that? I'll say a few more things about this, but just that's sort of a, just so, you, un, so that you understand what's, what do I mean by matrix product state. Um, so the advantage, the, ho the hope here is that Whatever data lives up here, or whatever tensor you're trying to represent, whether it's some wave function that could be the ground state of some quantum system, or maybe the state of a quantum computer somewhere as you're evolving a circuit, that you can try to capture it in this form with these ranks or bond dimensions, these numbers chi, that tell you how big are these indices, with those being kind of on the small side. So you want them to either be like two or four or 10, or maybe 100, maybe 1,000 or 10,000 is okay, but after that it would get too expensive. So that's what you're hoping for. Um, so you want to try to balance accuracy with these small ranks or bond dimensions. Um, one neat fact also about the theory of these is that if these chi's are big enough, you can represent any tensor whatsoever. But they have to be exponentially big for that to be true. So if you take the ones in the middle, the ones at the left kind of grow by powers of, of two or powers of your external indices. But if you take, by the, by, by, the, by the time you get to the middle, if you take them to be of the size about two to the n over two, you can represent any tensor whatsoever. 
But again, you, you hope they don't actually have to be that big. Um, so let's say you're in some application, though, where you get away with these being small, and you have a good approximation, then what's nice is that most of the algorithms that you wind up doing using these tensor networks require um, only kind of polynomial cost in chi to do computation or, or in terms of memory storage. So most algorithms require chi cube computation, chi squared memory, right? So if, if chi is like 10 or 100, that's, these are not such big numbers and you can do it. Um, so what are the kind of algorithms you can do? Some I'll just flash very briefly without going into many details for lack of time. And then the, I'll walk you through DMRG a little bit more because that's the kind of seminal one that we use in physics a lot. Um, there's, there's that, by, by now, there's quite a few algorithms, and I'll really dive into two tomorrow in quite some depth. But just to give you a flavor of how big the toolbox is, um, things you can do, you can sum two MPS or more than two in always staying in the compressed form. So if you have two MPS and they have small ranks or small bond dimensions, you can sum them, run an efficient algorithm that recompresses the sum on the fly, and then dynamically figures out the ranks of the new ones. And the rank might grow. Like if those two, those two MPS are very different, the, the rank afterward might just be the sum of the original two. But if it's, say, secretly they're the same, uh, the same tensor adding it to itself, the rank will be exactly the same afterward, and the algorithm can figure that out on, on its own. Um, you can also multiply tensor networks by other tensor networks. So if you have an MPS, you can, represent, you can multiply it by another kind of tensor network called an MPO, or tensor train matrix. So, it's, so if you think of MPS as kind of like a high-dimensional vector, MPO is like a high-dimensional matrix. So you can multiply these together, and again, there's a controlled algorithm, actually quite a few different ones, that runs across and compresses this network down and processes it into another MPS. And again, the bond dimensions might shrink, they might grow, they might stay the same, and the algorithm can figure that out for you, all with kind of polynomial cost. Um, and in fact, the cost is just linear in the length, um, always in these algorithms. And then one really neat thing you can do that I don't have um, slides on, but just something good to know, especially in the context of machine learning, is that when you have a tensor network without loops, so in this case it's just uh, a line, you can do perfect sampling, so they're autoregressive. The idea is that you can just draw a sample from treating the entries of the tensor as probabilities or the squares as probabilities, there's different versions of it. Um, you can draw a sample, and then when you want to draw the next sample, you don't have like a Markov chain or anything that's running, you just start the algorithm over and you get a new sample. So just by how the algorithm works, it's provably um, perfect sampling in the sense that there's no like autocorrelation time or anything like that. You just draw a sample, then you draw another one fresh and another one. So each sample is really drawn from the true distribution defined by the tensor network. So these are just nice algorithms to have. And there's other kinds too besides matrix product state. Um, there's more general trees. So these are just any kind of loopless tensor network. Um, they go by different names, tree tensor networks, hierarchical Tucker networks. And there's also tensor networks with loops. The most famous being the 2D, what's called PEPS tensor network. I also put tensor grid, which might be a more generic name. Um, sometimes called tensor product states. And these are um, quite popular in physics for studying like, things like 2D frustrated magnets and things like that. Um, but they're much more challenging to work with and optimize. Once they have loops, the algorithms get a lot tougher to do and to optimize. Um, so um, people often talk about, in kind of in a lot of parts of machine learning and, and even in physics and even in tensor networks, I've noticed people often like to emphasize um, representational power. So they like to really focus on statements like this about you can represent anything, or they talk about area law of entanglement, which I don't have any slides on, but some of you may have heard. How many people have heard of area law of entanglement? This idea, right? Okay, so this is very commonly associated with tensor networks. It says that you know, if, you have, um, if your entanglement of your system obeys an area law and the tensor network is your wave function, that these chi's can be bounded and, and remain small. So those are all about representational power. But I think personally, the real power of tensor networks is actually in the algorithms. That's really what I think is so powerful about it. The algorithms are based on linear algebra, and linear algebra is um, precise, fast, stable. Um, you know, it, it's a very nice set of algorithms to build all like more powerful algorithms on top of. And um, the most seminal of these, in terms of really what kicked off the field, is the density matrix renormalization group. So I'll just give you a quick kind of lightning introduction to how that works. So what it really is doing is it's solving a minimization problem equivalent to an eigenvector finding a dominant eigenvector of a huge matrix. But in physics language, it finds the energy, ground state energy, and the ground state of a Hamiltonian. Um, so let's assume we can write that Hamiltonian itself as a tensor network. And for common Hamiltonians, like local 1D Hamiltonians, even 2D, there's quite a ni few nice ways to do that. I won't go through how you do that, but there's just some closed form expressions you can write down for these, these tensors. You can also use numerical methods to find it. So let's just say the Hamiltonian's already in that form. 
um, which will be convenient for me, um, then DMRG runs, and what it does is it finds its dominant eigenvector, a ground state, as a as matrix product state tensor network. So first of all, you, you, you'd form the expression for the energy, and here I'm just taking the state to be always normalized for convenience. Um, it's just this sandwich of psi h psi, right? So that's a number, there's no indices sticking out. You can see how helpful the diagram notation is too, right? I wouldn't want to have to write this all out with letters and everything. Um, and what DMRG does is it uses an alternating strategy to optimize. So in math, they call this alternating least squares kind of strategy, meaning you just optimize, you freeze some of the parameters, the one in blue are frozen, and the ones in red, they're unfrozen, they're thawed, and so we optimize them, and then we refreeze them, and then we thaw some other ones, right? So we'll thaw these, then next we thaw these, and they go back and forth, and that's called sweeping in the physics um, jargon, but in math, they would just say it's an alternating strategy, okay? And then what do you do at each step? Um, what you do at each step is you, you, you factorize off or pull off the tensors that are unfrozen that you're trying to optimize, and then you actually view this as a miniature exact diagonalization problem that you have to solve. So here's, here comes the linear algebra in a sense, right? So what you do is you, you say, um, you take all these other tensors and there's an efficient, even though this looks like a lot of computation, all this rest, it's actually, there's an efficient pattern you can do to contract all of them down and it's not too bad. You actually leave them in three pieces. I'm, I'm not gonna go into that level of detail. But let's say for convenience, I just put them all together into one tensor. What you do next is you throw this into a Krilov eigensolver that does matrix multiplication and does some smart kind of linear algebra reasoning and figures out a better approximation to put back for this tensor. So you don't do gradient descent, you do something much, much faster that very quickly converges. And as a little detail to the experts, you don't really converge this part. You just run a few length shows or Kirillov steps just to push yourself closer to the ground state. Then you get a better tensor and then you put it back and then you, you move over to the next place. And there's some detail too about doing two tensors and factorizing to make the, the bond dimension grow and shrink that I'm not gonna get into right now. This is just kind of a lightning explanation of, of DMRG. This is called one site. DMRG. So let's just see how it works. So this is a movie I made of DMRG running on 100 sites, spin half Heisenberg model, and the speed of the movie is about real time on the computer. So it's pretty close to how fast it actually runs. And what these heights are that I'm plotting are the local energies. These are just, in the current wave function, what's the ex expected value of S dot S on a bond and showing during the movie. So here it goes, right? That's sweep one. And you can see already these energies are, are, are coming down very nicely, um, okay? Great, there you go. No, sorry, I think I miswrote what it is. These are the magnetizations, sorry. So these are the expected value of, of S. That's why they go to zero. The energy is at the top. It's a little, little mistake in my slides there, but I'll run that again. And it's fun to watch the energy in the corner. It shows the total energy and you can see it coming down very fast. So watch as once it gets the first few digits, it really starts putting on the correct energy digit by digit by digit. So these are very, very fast and precise algorithms when they work in the best case. But you can kind of see already many digits are frozen and it's just kind of working on the last few. Okay, so that's actually about a real time run of DMRG for that system. Okay, so it's an extremely powerful algorithm. Here's a talk I just saw two weeks ago and I clipped the paper um, about this talk where um, Ian McCulloch and um, Osborne are showing um, new methods for um, improving DMRG, kind of improving it even more to make it more stable and, and more reliable. And you can just see how precise this method is. So the error from the energy you get at each, at each step in time of the running time of the algorithm compared to the exact energy is just coming down on this log scale to very high precision. So in the end you get 10 to the minus nine error in like 100 seconds, so very efficient algorithm. Um, so then the motivation, at least for me, and I think some other people was, this is working so well in physics and there's all these other areas of, of application we can envision. And after all, tensor networks are basically just function approximators, right? What's so special about wave functions? Couldn't we use this for other things too? Maybe, maybe they only work for wave functions, right? But that would seem like a kind of strange state of the world, especially when you see neural networks coming over and they can represent wave functions too. So then if tensor networks can represent wave functions, couldn't they represent functions, you know? Uh, in other areas. So could we harness the same power for something like machine learning? Um, and I would say that the answer is yes, but then the question is, you know, how well does it work? What's gonna happen in this field? And I'll, and I'll try to unpack that for you today and tomorrow. Um, and I would say there's three challenges in doing this. Not that these are insurmountable challenges, but what I mean is these are like the three main things you have to think about when you're trying to do some application like this, like applying tensor networks to machine learning. And they are representing the data, 
coming up with algorithms for training, and then selecting good problems, like problems where this tool is the most advantageous to use. Because it could be that, that you know, 20 years from now, this finds a lot of applications, but they might be really different applications from, say, neural networks. So it may still be that neural networks is what you want to use for vision, and then tensor networks will be better for other things. And we just don't know right now. I'd say there still hasn't been enough research on this to really know, and we're just still kind of figuring it out. And some of these algorithms are still just being discovered, even right now. So it's, it's a pretty active area, but I would say it could use more people, like maybe some of you getting into it and helping to push it forward. Okay, today I'm mostly gonna focus on representation of data, which is actually more interesting than it sounds. And then tomorrow um, I'll be talking more about training algorithms and good problem selection. Okay, so um, representation of data. So again, more interesting I think than it sounds. So uh, let's say we're given a piece of data, like a sample from some data set, and here I'm thinking of images just because it's more you know, visual. And um, let's say that, that each piece of data we get from that data set has n, piece, n numbers in it, like n pieces of information, right? So what I mean by that is let's say we reach into the MNIST handwriting data set and we pull out one of the images and it's an image of the number one and then we count how many pixels there are and there's n pixels. So that's like n numbers that we would get when we, when we read that image in, right? These are just these n grayscale values. Okay, so a very common thing you do in machine learning is you just vectorize that. You just unroll those pixels as a big vector. And this might be like the thing you put in at the bottom of a neural network or, or the beginning of a neural network and you see all those input neurons. It's just these numbers from this vector x, right? So we could just view our data abstractly as this vector of length n. Okay, and this is a good part to stop me if you have any questions if I go too fast through any part. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two basic representations. This is just kind of my own take on on these two, this distinction. In the end, we'll see there's kind of a continuum in between them of how you can mix these two ideas. But one representation I'm calling high dimensional representation, and the other will be low dimensional. So high dimensional, um, the idea is that if you have n, your vector is of length n, then you're gonna represent this by some kind of tensor with the same number of indices as that, as n indices. So I'm calling that high dimensional, because this is a tensor that lives in like a, formally in like a two to the n dimensional space, right? if these are indices of size two. If they're indices of size, you know, 255, it's a 255 to the n dimensional space. But you're just putting the data in a very tiny corner of that space, all right? Um, and I'll give you a concrete example of what these vectors could be. But what I'm saying is you take each pixel and you map it to a vector, then you just formally put these vectors kind of next to each other, like in an outer product. And if you actually took that outer product, you would get a vector of length like two to the 784 or something, something enormous. But you don't really take the outer product, you just imagine taking it, right? So you just put it in this little corner, product state corner of high dimensions. So I'm calling that you know, high dimensional or state encoding or product encoding. I'll give you a really concrete formula in a minute. The other one is low dimensional representation. Um, this one's been known for a long time and rediscovered in many fields and in many different cases. So this goes by other names like amplitude encoding or quantix tensor train. Um, it's a very common idea in quantum computing. So if you know about the HHL algorithms or PDE solving with quantum computers, um, Grover's algorithm, um, you know, all these, just, just actually the number system we use every day, that's this encoding, right? Um, the idea of having a base and decimals. Um, and I'll, I'll go in some more detail about that in a minute too. But just to say what I mean by low dimensional, it may look really similar to this one, right? There's a bunch of indices, what's different? What I mean is that here you only use log n indices. So if you have n, let's say there's 64 pixels, you only use um, eight indices to represent that, the data. So it's very different, very low dimensional, even though it's a tensor. And what's interesting too is that generally the tensor is entangled, like the bond dimension is not one. Here it's one. So that seems kind of paradoxical, but we'll unpack what I mean. Okay, so let's go into a little bit more detail about high dimensional representation, right? So, mm -hmm. yes. Well, that's a good question. Really, um, it's not, that's, that's not a, a hard and fast rule um, that this one is a product state and this one's an MPS. But it, it's mostly what I really, the distinction I'm really making is um, how many indices there are and how each setting of the index corresponds to data. Um, and I'll, I'll go through that in some more detail. Basically here, um, um, I think the examples will help. But um, I, I think it's just easiest for this one to choose forms where um, it's not an MPS. You could make it an MPS and that's more like projecting the data. So kind of excluding certain patterns. 
We could talk, it's, it's a little bit hard to cover all of this, but we could talk more about the advantage of that. Here it's more necessarily kind of entangled because um, the, the indices work cooperatively. I'll have a slide explaining what I mean by that. But the indices cooperatively kind of walk you through the data in this form. So we can be really concrete about that. So high dimensional representation, this one is mot motivated more by like second quantization for those of you, you know, thinking like, like quantum physicist. Um, and this is one that um, was proposed in 2016 by a paper I was on and then this other paper from the math community. And um, you can kind of think of it as a fanciful way in the case of images, is that you take each pixel of an image and you kind of promote it to a spin or a qubit. That's, how, that's a physics language. In a math language, you just map it to a small vector. And then you take all these vectors in an outer product with each other. And this is just a formal outer product, meaning you just write the outer product and you stop. You don't actually try to multiply all these vectors together because then you would end up with this exponentially big vector that you wouldn't want to store, right? And there's different ways to do this. So one is to map um, the x values, say they go from zero to one, into this vector cosine and sine with pi over two. So it just rotates from you know, pointing up to pointing sideways as x goes from zero to one. But another form that actually I'm gonna use this one because it's a little easier to explain some things with is just to use one and x. That's a different form you can use. And we'll see in a minute why that's an interesting choice. And you can pick many other choices. And these choices, um, the name I like to use for this is local feature map. So it's saying, um, this is borrowing the term feature map from kernel learning. It's saying, how do I take a number and kind of lift it, feature map it into a set of features? Here the features are cosine and sine. Here the features are one and x. You could pick other features. You could pick you know, x squared and e to the x. You could pick any features you want. It's a bit like kernel learning where the kernel is a bit made up and you can just try different things. Or like neural networks where you just kind of make up an initial weight layer. It could have this width or that width. It's just something that you come up with and think through the implications of. Okay. Um, now how do you, uh, you, know, you, you do this local feature map, you take this, this formal product of all these vectors, how do you turn this into an actual model you could use in machine learning? So in the end, we're after a function representation with weights that we can train, right? Um, you do this by just contracting it with a weight tensor. So you say, here's this um, outer product of vectors. I just need a weight tensor that has the same number of indices so that when I contract all this together, the whole result is a number, right? There's no indices left over. They're all contracted, okay? Um, and then that's clearly just a function of x1 through xn because here's all the x's going in down here. I just picked six to be concrete, but it could be any n you want. But that would have the problem, the curse of dimensionality. Too many indices, right? If I'm doing MNIST, it has 784 or something pixels. I can't do two to the 784 weights, way too many weights. So then the idea is to say, um, I'll jump ahead and kind of jump back, is to use a tensor network to make this more efficient. So what if we just guess or hope that the weights can be replaced by a tensor network? Now we have a chance of doing this, of actually training this thing, right? And then the idea is just as having a larger bond dimension for this MPS, you could represent any tensor, um, for large enough bond dimension. Um, here, if we have a higher bond dimension of rank, we'd have more parameters, more representational power in this model. Okay, but what kind of model is this, right? Um, at least for this example of this local feature map and this kind of data encoding, this kind of model is actually just a very high order polynomial. So this gets into like why, what motivates this choice in the first place, right? So if you just think about ticking the indices, let's say each index just runs, has to run over two values here, right? Because each vector has two entries. If you just think of ticking the indices through all their values, but in kind of an organized way, maybe kind of motivated by thinking of like perturbation theory, right? You have like a vacuum and then you have one particle popping out of the vacuum or two particles. Um, you could have all the indices set to one and then that just picks one, 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 one. So you just get a scalar. So that's like a constant shift. Or you could have one of the indices to two and all the rest are one. So let's say the first one is two, setting two. That picks out this x1 down here. And then these are all one, so we just pick the number one, 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 right? And so you get this weight, w2, one, 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 times the parameter, like times the input x1. Or if the two is in the second place, it's times x2, or the third place is times x3, okay? But we could also have the, the, the entries in the weight tensor where two of the indices are to the number two. And then we get x1 times x2, x1 times x3. In kernel langu um, language, they would say these are like product features. They would even say product interactions. I, I wouldn't really call these interactions because in physics that means something else. Um, and then as so on, you can have more three twos, four twos. Finally, when you have all the twos, all the indices are set to two, you have this huge product of all the x's. So this is actually a very nonlinear function, very high dimensional nonlinear function. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, great. Now, once you replace the weights with a tensor network, it could be an MPS, it could be something else. It's a little less clear what the function actually is, right? 
is it still really this polynomial? Not really, it, it kind of is, but now the Ws are related to each other in some way. There's some kind of extra structure that you're assuming or putting in. So maybe the structure is that the data is one dimensional, right? So maybe these Xs are amplitudes of sound or something having to do with the words, right? So then this one dimensional ansatz makes more sense. If it's an image, maybe it doesn't make as much sense, but you could still just brute force it and it might still work, right? Um, so how do you actually use this to do machine learning? Um, you know, if you were just doing a kind of machine learning where a scalar output is what you want, then this is all you need. Um, if you want a multi-label or vector output, you can, one way to do that is to put an extra index. Another way would just be to use multiple MPS, one for each label, so you can try different things. It's kind of a very flexible uh, framework. So let's just say you put an extra index that runs over as many values as many labels you have. So let's say you have 10 labels, this extra index could be dimension 10. It's a bit arbitrary where you put it, you can put it on the left, somewhere in the middle. You know, if you made a tree, it'd be more natural. You put it at the top of the tree, right? I'm just being kind of general here. Um, and then one way to train this model, and tomorrow I'll show you two much more detailed and interesting ways, but a more kind of uh, basic way is just to train this model by having some kind of cost function that determines your learning task. So here I'm thinking of supervised learning, which is equivalent to regression, where you have data, which are these inputs xj, and then you also have uh, target outputs y that are like what you wish the function would output for those inputs, right? So you have the x's and the y's, that's your data set. And then you say, I wish f would output y j for every x j that I put in, so I'll penalize it when it doesn't, and then I'll try to minimize this cost. So then you just, using the chain rule, you know, take the derivative of that cost back through until you hit the weights where you actually have parameters you can optimize. You, you work out the gradient, you know, you use, use the usual gradient descent algorithm. If some of you don't know it, we can discuss, but I think you've been hearing about it. Um, and you just alternate back and forth and use gradient descent. And you just go back and forth through and update these one at a time or maybe two at a time and do that until you've minimized your cost function, right? That's the most basic way you can try to do this. Question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the, the bonds sticking at the bottom are always two for this kind of feature map. If you used more features, it could be more. But yeah, in this case, it's two. It's a good question. And the one at the top could be 10 or 100. It's as many labels as you're trying to, as many different kind of discrete Ys that you're trying to output. If the Ys are a number, then um, yeah, there might be a slight mismatch here between the math at the bottom and the top. Um, really, this F should now have an index on it. And the Y should be a little vector now. I, I should have fixed that. Here I'm having f output a number and the y's are numbers, but, but yeah, you can see how to generalize that. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Or on, in this case on that site, yeah. So I'm saying each of these circles, I unfreeze, I kind of flip the colors in this slide, but you know, I, I unfreeze the one that's blue, the rest in red are frozen, and I just optimize the ones in, that I'm pointing at with that arrow and then I go back and forth. And there's, there, you don't have to do it this way, but this would just be a nice, efficient, pretty efficient way to do it. Good question, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question, I think so. so um, so this is where I think more research is needed because right now this, this idea of using tensor networks is pretty ad hoc, I would say, in terms of theory for machine learning. But actually I think that's a real opportunity too is that there's, so, there's been so much success in theory for tensor networks in physics, I don't see why we couldn't bring that success over. It might have to be rethought and redone, but I think the potential for theory to be done is very high with sensor networks, and I think I'll, I'll make good on that a bit tomorrow and show you some of that. But um, some things we could feel pretty confident about are that, let's say in this 1D kind of architecture, um, that the larger you make this internal bond dimension, the bonds going through here, then the, long, the longer distance correlations you can capture, that's for sure. Because you can show that correlations generically decay in these 1D networks, and they decay, they eventually cross over to exponential decays. But over short distance scales, they can reproduce power laws very well. And the kind of how far they can mimic a power law before they cross over to exponential is related to the bond dimension. So if it's bigger, you can mimic a power law for a very long distance. And in fact, you can even do arbitrary, you know, all to all type of correlations over short distances as well. So hopefully that kind of goes some way to answering your question. But it's not, um, I would say it's mostly not something that we just have a very clear theory of right now, in fact. Um, it's something that we need more theory about. <laughs>
Okay, so that was just kind of giving the most basic strategy for optimizing um, one of these tensor network machine learning models. And like I mentioned, tomorrow I'll show you two much more sophisticated strategies for doing this that don't involve gradients. Um, so then, this was something that um, I was really interested in 2016 and proposed this model. And we just wanted to try it on something that you know, was, was popular. So we tried this MNIST handwriting data set, the supervised learning, where you're given these images, they're labeled you know, zero to nine, and you try to predict those labels by just you know, taking, these, taking these images and feeding them into the model. Um, so we tried the simplest thing, which was basically this, this model, though with that cosine sine feature map. And um, we did the gradient descent training um, and trained um, to 99.95% accuracy on the training set which is 60,000 images, and then we got a little bit above 99% accuracy on the testing set, which is only 97 of them incorrect. So we were happy with that. We, that was just to show that like, the idea can work. We didn't use all the best practices of machine learning. We kind of snooped on our data, if you know what that means. Like We were like watching it, checking on the test set over and over again during training, doing all kind of things you're not supposed to do. But the point of it was just to show that there does exist some choice of parameters that makes this true. That was the only point of that that experiment at that time. Um, just to go in a little more detail, um, we tried different bond dimensions. We tried bond dimension 10, and we got a 5% tested error, raised it to 20, going down to 2%, and we had to go to 120 to get below 1%. And the thing about it is 120 is not that big by physics standards. Like people routinely do DMRG with bond dimensions of like 10,000 these days. And I think there's even a paper doing 60,000 using TPUs at Google, right? So 120 is not that big, and yet this calculation took quite a bit of time. Um, because 60,000 is a big prefactor when you're turning over all that data. So this is why I was saying we need better algorithms, and I'll show you tomorrow what I mean. Um, okay, so that was just kind of a quick uh, walk through the high-dimensional story. Um, now let me switch to the low-dimensional story, which in some ways is even more interesting. Um, some of this is about some things I've, been, I've just been learning about recently, and um, hopefully it'll be interesting to some of you too. So the low-dimensional representation, um, in the high-dimensional representation, right, each each index was like corresponding to one pixel of the image. Or if it was a sound signal, it would be like one moment in time or something. In the low dimensional representation, the indices are different. They work collectively to access each feature. If you want to go give me feature number seven, all the indices work together to go get that feature out of the tensor for you. So um, it's kind of like first quantization versus second quantization, where um, in second quantization, the tensors are just points in space. In first quantization, you're storing like positions of particles, like something very different. Um, let, me, let me be concrete about how this works. So let's say we have, again, our data vector. It could be the same data vector. Um, and here I'm zero indexing it. So the first entry is x zero, and then going up to x n minus one. Um, what we do is we pack that into a tensor in the following way. We just use binary integers to do the encoding. So we say if all the indices are zero, that number inside that tensor is, should be x zero, okay? Now if we make the last one one, that's x1. And then if we you know, make one zero at the end, that's x2, x3, right? So I'm just doing binary counting. These are just the binary digits going across the top, all right? Um, so what I'm doing is like, you know, before we turned a, a list of numbers into a tensor that lives in a two to the n dimensional space, you know, um, when we had n entries. Here we're just doing something like, we have n entries and we're going to um, use log n bits, okay? That's something kind of different. Um, Okay, and so on. And then once we set all the indices to one, that's the last entry of the uh, vector. Um, now, a really neat thing you can do with this low dimensional form is you can use it to represent a continuum. So same trick, but you just kind of reimagine it a little bit differently. You say, um, uh, we could represent data, uh, um, you know, represent it in a continuum. So for example, it could be a function f evaluated on a very fine grid of spacing one over two to the n. So if n is how many of these indices we have, like little n, um, Let's say we have you know, like eight indices. We could have a grid of size two to the eight. And the grid is just putting in these binary integers, but now they're after the decimal point, right? So if they're after the decimal point, we could have you know, 0, 0.0000 is the number zero. And then all the way up to 0 0.111111 is like approximating the number 0 0.99 in, in decimal fractions, okay? I'll go through that in some more detail. Um, but the idea is we can, we can take this continuum, we can turn it into a grid, think of that grid as having a length n, but then we only need log n bits to put this thing into a tensor, right? Um, so all we do is we just define the tensor so that there's n bits, and these n bits are the n digits that we have. And as you all know, you can represent 
with a handful of digits, like you know, 20 digits, you can represent a very fine grid. You, know, you can work to very high precision in a continuum. Okay? So we can just see how to do this. So for example, if we set all the bits to zero, that's f of zero, we put that number in the tensor. If we set the first bit to one, this is in base two, so we jump halfway through the continuum. So that's f of a half, right, but in base two. Um, now if we set the next bit to one, we jump to three quarters, that's f of three quarters, right, but in base two. Um, and then you also have very fine precision here. So if you start toggling the last bit back and forth, you're moving by just one grid point from you know, three quarters to three quarters plus one over two to the n, whatever n is, whatever precision you want to work at. Okay, any questions about that? So this is actually a way of like um, inputting a continuous variable into a tensor. So this tensor, like tensors, you know, before I was showing how they eat a bunch of discrete variables. Here, all these indices are working collectively to swallow one continuous variable. So this is like f of x as a tensor. So this may go toward the question you were asking earlier too. Um, what's neat about this too is this is actually a hierarchical representation, representation of data. It's like a multi-grid method. Okay, but this is also, I just want to emphasize, even though I'm saying fancy things about it, this is also just the regular number system we use every day, just in base two, but it would be the same in base 10, right? So it's, even though it's something very old, it's something kind of profound that when we count, we're actually counting in a hierarchical representation, right, like a multi-scale representation. Um, so the idea is that we can locate numbers, we can say, um, how do we represent um, a half minus one over two to the n? So this is the number just before a half. Um, we represent it by writing zero, um, one, 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 you know, with a bunch of ones. So this is like walking down a tree. We go, we say, take the left half, then take the right half of that, and then the right half of that, and then the right half of that. So we kind of zoom in exponentially finely toward a point, right? Or we could say, what about this point? I don't really know how to describe it. Maybe this is, I guess this is just the number one quarter, right? So then um, we say one quarter is just go in the left half, then go to the right half of that, but then don't go any further. Okay, so you walk it down this tree and that's how you locate that point and so on. So you can just do, that's three quarters, right? Okay, um, so that's, that's what I mean about this kind of low dimensional representation. You can do it either as a way of just unpacking a vector or as actually um, rolling up a whole continuum vector of points. So you can, you can view it in either form. Um, so as an example application of this low dimensional idea, there's this paper just from 2022 that I really like where they actually did a mixed representation. This is a really neat idea. They said, let's take, again, MNIST, although they focused, they focused on fashion MNIST, which is a much more challenging data set, which is these black and white images of clothing, like shoes, handbags, shirts, things like that. It's very challenging, actually. Like The highest um, accuracies you see reported are things like maybe only 90 to 92% on the test set, even by very state-of-the-art deep neural networks and things. So it's very challenging. Um, they said, let's do this high dimensional encoding between the patches. So there you put those into like a product with each other. But then within the patch, we'll just do this kind of zigzag or snake and do this low dimensional encoding. So you see there's four things that are like in a product with each other, but then within each patch, there's a small MPS. That's these different color short MPSs in the bottom. So they're kind of taking the data and each of these is just that vector unrolled in that little bits kind of hierarchical form. You know, and then they just product these together more like that first thing I showed you. So the idea here is to kind of balance the benefits of each one. Um, e when you do the low dimensional encoding, you're basically just working with the original vector you had, just representing it in kind of a neat way. The high dimensional encoding, you're really going up in dimension, so you have a much more powerful classifier. So this is some way of kind of getting some of the power, but then not having something that's so high dimensional that it's like hard to train and too expensive and that kind of thing. So it's a really good idea. Um, and when they did this idea, they actually only needed to take the weight MPS, which is this light purple one on top, to have a bond dimension of 10. And they got um, very close to state-of-the-art results. They got something like 90% on the test set, which is really good for fashion MNIST. So I thought this is just a really great idea. And they also experimented with the bond dimension of this, um, this low dimensional data encoding on the bottom. Okay, great, yeah. Except for what, sorry? <laughs> 
We don't, no. Yeah. Oh, certain like Chi Max? Um, we don't. So I, I think it's more of, it's a good question. I think it's more, right now, it's more of an opportunity. So these kind of studies are more just showing that it, it can work. They're, they're very empirical. And so they're showing that it can work. So then the question is, it already works. So then why does it work? You know? we don't, that's the kind of knowledge we have right now. So it already works. And then the question is, what makes it work? You know? Versus another way of asking the question would be, can we show that it will work ahead of time? You know? And we don't have that. That work has basically not been done, as far as I'm aware. Um, for, for sort of general things like images. Now, it, there has been some very deep work done for functions, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of that tomorrow, but if you remember back to the, um, the sum of Gaussians that I showed, there's some extremely nice work showing how tensor networks are able to capture functions like that. Like, for example, you can rigorously prove that essentially any smooth function, when you represent it in this low dimensional form I mentioned, has a low bond dimension, and you can actually bound how low in certain senses. So for example, if a function can be fit by a polynomial of order p, the bond dimension is exactly p plus one at most. So you can, you can prove things like that for functions. So that's also a little bit of what I meant about, um, right now we have um, some areas like images where we have very little theory. Um, we have other areas where we have a lot more, and also that tensor networks may have more of a niche role to play. So they might be, in the end, quite good for machine learning functions, like math functions. And maybe they'll never be very good at images compared to neural nets, but maybe not. It's, I think it's just too early to say. But it's a, it's a good question to ask. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes? You can, I just don't have that available to me right now. Um, but I would say basically, though, roughly from my experience or what I, I think I know to be the right con comparison just off the top of my head, is that that first study I showed, the one of just, just MNIST with the gradient descent, it's a lot of parameters. It's, not, it's a lot more than an equivalent neural net. Um, and this is because, in a sense, very roughly, um, that in a way, a tensor network has to use the parameters in, for two things. It has to use the parameters both to sort of like be the weights and to kind of do the nonlinearities, so to speak. So in a, in a neural network, you've written down the nonlinearities as a piece of code that runs on the computer, and they're explicit, and you write them down. In a tensor network, the thing that's kind of analogous to the nonlinearities is also modeled by the parameters in the tensors also. So some of those parameters are going into that. I, I, I can't prove this, but this is just my intuition, that some of the parameters are going into kind of that part of the work, and some are going into saying, this is big, this is small, weight this more, weight this less. So it's, it's not as parameter efficient. Um, but that's why I think the real, um, the real way to compare them in the end will be um, not by counting parameters, because that's a very like gradient descent centric view of, of things, but to actually compare them in terms of the best algorithm you can think of for each one, and then how fast does it run, and how, you know, how reliable and reproducible are the results, and how interpretable and accurate, and things like that. So in the end, I think that the algorithms, is, that's why I think that's the key point. Is, is, you know, if we can come up with much better algorithms that maybe don't touch the parameters as many times, for example, that's the way forward, I think. Yeah, did that answer your question? Um, one other partial answer to your question, too, is that you see just by a small tweak of the idea here that these authors did, they needed a much smaller bond dimension. So, so the thing I did, we needed 120 on MNIST, and they only need 10 on fashion MNIST, so just by changing the architecture a little bit. So you know, there's still a lot of exploration. This is not that old of a paper, um, there's still a lot of exploration going on about how to best use these ideas. It's still pretty new. Mm -hmm. You could, and that, that could be a neat thing to do. Although I should have emphasized more strongly um, that, and I'm gonna have another slide saying this a different way, but that the nonlinearity is already here. So you, these are already, there's already like an upfront nonlinearity in the idea. Um, so you see this is already nonlinear, right? Just by mapping the x into that tensor in the first place, it's nonlinear. But it's more in the spirit of kernel learning where the, um, you know, in kernel learning, I'll s I have a slide about this later too, but in kernel learning the idea is that the nonlinearity happens once up front on the data, and then that way all the weights enter linearly, which has a lot of theoretical advantages, but it has a big drawback too, which is like a lot of weights, you know. So 
so it's just, there's always been this kind of back and forth in the field between those two, and right now neural networks are kind of ascendant, but I don't know if that has to be the case forever. I mean, we'll see where it goes. You know, in, in the end, it doesn't have to really be one versus the other. We might have hybrid architectures, and there's some papers about that. Maybe we use neural nets as initial layers, and then we switch to tensor networks, and I'll even mention you can use, you can flip that around too. I'll show you a slide on that in a second. So let's end with a few slides um, to kind of round out the talk on just a couple of kind of more theoretical remarks about using tensor networks and machine learning. And, and you've already asked a lot of the right questions, some of you, about you know, what can we prove, what's known, what's not known, how do they compare. Um, one thing that's nice, I think, is that it's actually very straightforward to show a kind of universal approximation theorem for tensor networks, even for continuous inputs, right? And here's the, here's the theorem in kind of two slides, right? And it doesn't require a lot of heavy math. It's basically almost just like an observation. So the, the argument is this, is that we say, um, remember how I said you can represent any discrete function as a tensor network, meaning a function taking discrete variables. We can also do any continuous variables as well by just blocking um, the bits together. We could say for this input x1, we'll just use a set of bits, n bits, for, you know, those, those collectively represent x1. You know, here's x2, here's x3. If it's discrete, we just put a one index, which would be discrete. If it's continuous, we just put in a little group of n. And we can make that as precise as you want, exponentially precise. So if I use like 20 indices, I can represent that continuum to one over two, two to the 20 precision. So extremely precise, right? Um, and then the tensor has arbitrary uh, entries here. I can put any entries I want. So I can store any function on this exponentially fine continuum grid that I want, okay? So that's, that's already kind of a universal approximation theorem for tensors for functions of continuous variables. Um, and then I can say to, make, to try to make this efficient, I can now replace that tensor by a network like a matrix product state or some other kind. Um, and then for a large enough bond dimension, it's been proved, it's easy to prove that MPS can represent any tensor. So there you go, that's, there's the universal approximation theorem, right? So the point is, is that you know, tensor networks have one too. That was the whole proof basically. Um, and there's no, again, there's no explicit nonlinearities in, in the tensor network. All the nonlinearities are kind of in the representations of how do you put the data in in the first place in some sense. Okay. Um, and then I also had said, just said this in words, but one slide to say that this idea of tensor network machine learning is really a form of kernel learning. So if you're familiar with kernel learning or if you run across it later, this is just one slide to connect that for those of you who know that concept. The concept is basically, from my point of view, just this formula. It's saying that you... Um, take a linear model would be where you don't have this phi, so imagine that phi is covered up. Linear model is like w dot x, right? Kernel learning is just saying, what if we like supercharge that model by saying, we don't want x, x is too low dimensional. We wanna make x bigger, so we put it into a feature map phi, which makes it bigger. So the feature map could be this kind of idea. I mean, there's many ideas. You could put it into some Gaussian function or something. Um, and then you say, now that we've made x into phi of x, which is this bigger, higher dimensional feature mapped version of x. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen like David Byrne wearing the big suit, right, from like talking heads. It's kind of like you just put x into like a bigger suit. Um, now you have more weights you can train because phi is much bigger than, than x. And then the weights just enter linearly. It's still like a linear classifier for that part of the model, right? And you can see that tensor network machine learning is the same idea. We just feed x into this, this feature map. It's high dimensional, although somehow efficient product, you know, it's rank one, it's a product, something we can work with. And then the weights are also high dimensional, but then the other idea is that we compress the weights. So if you know about kernel learning, maybe some of you don't and that's okay, but the, if you read their literature, they have this idea called the kernel trick where they say, the weights are too high dimensional, we could never see them or even imagine them. You don't even wanna look at the weights, your eyes would melt out of your head, weights are bad. You know, they kinda have that view, right? And they're right, if you really, tried to work with all the weights. So they do this thing called the kernel trick where they pass to this thing called the dual representation. They train these dual weights that are smaller, that's more connected to the size of your training set. But then you have bad scaling with the size of your training set. So the idea of this program is to kind of flip that around and say, hold on, maybe we can look at the weights if we look at them as a tensor network. And then we can have good scaling with the training set. All these algorithms I'm gonna mention are linear scaling with the training set, which is the best you can do. And, um, and then, you know, Maybe we'll be back in the game with kernel learning. But then we have to think harder now about, okay, so we've, we've kind of immediately solved those problems up front, but now we have to optimize a tensor network, which has a lot of parameters. So, so we have to think of better algorithms. So that's kind of my like, one slide thesis on that, that connection. Um, and to wrap up, there's many other papers that have been now written about this basic idea about you know, 
models, you know, mixing machine learning and tensor networks. Just two to show you how diverse this, this topic is already becoming, um, or three papers. One that I find really nice, um, this, this actually precedes the work I showed by quite a bit and came out of the math community, and it's still, I still see it being used, you know, every month I'll see a paper about this in different forms, is using tensor trains, tensor train matrices, tensor networks inside of neural networks. So this is a really neat idea, right? So there's even some papers, I think, from last year about using them inside of large, large language models. And the idea is to reduce the number of parameters. So you say, what if, instead of an arbitrary weight layer, this weight layer was an MPO, or a tensor train matrix, or that kind of thing, some kind of tensor network. Um, then, we don't have to store all the weights, we store them in a compressed form. And then when you do the gradient descent, you do the gradient descent through these tensor network weights, but still with the nonlinearities and all the other parts of a neural network. And this neural network could be also a transformer or any other kind of thing. Um, then, then can we get some kind of advantage in terms of training time and cost, and maybe not lose any accuracy, and indeed they find they don't lose very much accuracy when they do that. Um, another paper that's really nice, uh, just from last year by Thomas Barthel and collaborators is, um, more in the spirit of the stuff I did show you, where it's more this kernel learning with, with tensor network weights. But the idea is that they further factorize each tensor into some kind of sum of vectors. So they say everywhere we have this tree, so they use a tree instead of an MPS, and in every node of the tree, they actually say is a sum of an outer product of three vectors, and that's, that's what they do. And then they train through that, and they find that the training is much faster, they get really state-of-the-art accuracy on images and things, so there's some really neat work out there, I would say. So I'm kind of running out of time for today, so let me just wrap up. Um, I was just kind of outlining today a very broad framework for machine learning using tensor networks. So the idea is we could bring over ideas and tools from physics and also now applied math into machine learning. Um, so ideas like you give me Hamiltonian, I can give you its dominant eigenvector or ground state. Maybe now you could say I give you data and I can give you some weights that are compressed and do machine learning that way, with hopefully some of the same advantages over time. Adaptivity, speed, precision, linear algebra ideas. I'll show you again more tomorrow about all that. Um, and then the question is, you know, does it really deliver? I'm sure a lot of you are very practical. Like, you're maybe thinking, should I use this or should I just ignore this, right? Um, I would say as of right now, 2024, it really depends. For images and computer vision, there's some promising results. I showed you, you know, these results, but it's not like competitive in the simplest way of like, you can't download a package right now and just beat something on ImageNet. It's not like that right now. Some, somewhat just because of software. Also, we just don't know the best ways to use it, right? People developing neural networks, um, the, the usual story you hear is that like, there were neural networks and there were GPUs and boom, it started working, right? That's like the story people like to tell. But the real story is that it was this like 12 people working on it since the 80s who got ignored and passed over for grants. You couldn't get a talk into NeurIPS about, about neural networks in the 90s, you know. It was fringe. You can watch these videos even from as recently as 20, 2009, I think, where there's this whole course on machine learning and there's like one lecture on neural networks and the rest is all kernel learning and things like that, right? And then whew, it just switched around in 2012 completely, right? Um, so you never know. This is like right now a very small niche area. Maybe it'll say small, maybe it'll grow. We'll find out. Um, but so I was saying that, as I was saying to some of the people asking questions, tensor networks have relatively a lot of parameters compared to an equivalent neural network. If you do gradient descent, it's kind of slow and heavy, it uses a lot of memory. Um, but there are opportunities to go much, much faster than gradients. Tensor networks, after all, are just linear algebra in high dimensions, period. That's what they are. That's, that's really what they are. So if you like linear algebra and you think it's good, you, you kind of have to like tensor networks is sort of my, my thesis. And for low and medium dimensional functions, it's already very powerful. So people are doing some pretty incredible things right now in kind of medium dimensions. So 3D functions, eight dimensional functions, six dimensional functions with tensor networks, and I'll highlight those tomorrow. Things like um, machine learning orbitals for quantum chemistry, fluid flows of PDEs, um, things, you know, optimizing landscapes, controlling robot arms. So I'll, sh I'll flash a few of those results for you tomorrow. And I'm going to focus on two novel algorithms. Um, and it's going to be a bit more technical tomorrow. So kind of bring your thinking caps and I'll show you how these algorithms work in some more details. And we'll think about what promise those could hold. So thanks a lot for your questions and, and for your time. Thanks. <laughs> a lot for this very nice talk. Uh, I think you still have uh, 10 minutes for questions, so we can go on with the questions, please. Mm -hmm. So let's use the microphone. Mm 
Yeah, thank you for this very nice lecture. It was very interesting. I have a question regarding LLMs because I mean, they're all the craze right now. So mm -hmm. why, why not ask a question about it? So in that, for LLMs, you have to work really hard to bring like words, syllables, whatever you want into a language, like a form that the LLM can understand. Like you have to do the tokenization and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Like aren't tensor networks, uh, aren't they already in kind of form of a transformer decoder, right? You, you already have like a sort of a very discretized input, get an out, probabilities and output, like wouldn't that be like a kind of a natural application? I think so. I mean, I think, I think a lot of questions that my, people might ask, my answer might have to just be, we don't know, like hasn't been tried enough. Like it's really, I think, a nice idea. Um, so there's this really nice paper by Dario Poletti, I think from like 2017 or so, um, where he had the idea of something like, um, and I'm, I'm still really curious, like a lot of these papers are just out there, and as far as I know, they've only been followed up on like a little bit, um, because it's just not enough people trying these things out at this time. Um, that, and I think also the people who have tried it have mostly tried with gradient methods, and as I mentioned, I think that's probably ultimately not the way to use gradient. I think we have to use some other algorithms, and I'll, I'll mention those two tomorrow that I'm gonna go into. Um, but um, I think if I'm remembering correctly, the idea was to have this kind of MPO type architecture, and then you would um, input like a string of characters, um, you know, and then you would read on the other side something like this, you know, and then this, these would just be some kind of, I'm not gonna read state or something, and you know, there would be some form like that, you know, and then th there was actually some success of some idea like this where you would have this kind of input part of the tensor network and then you'd switch to an output mode. Um, so I can give you this reference, but it's, it's by Poletti. Um. Mm -hmm. Yes, Some questions? Um, <clears throat> so if you imagine for simplicity to have a one-dimensional function like the one that you're showing right now on the slide, mm -hmm. and you do the thing you were explaining, so you have a grid of points that are two to the n, mm -hmm. and you do the low dimensionality encoding, so in that case, uh, the hemming distance between uh, two strings uh, doesn't have anything to do with the uh, Euclidean distance uh, on the line. Mm -hmm. Is this a problem uh, and is there a way out? And also in 3D. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think it's not, a, it's not immediately a problem. Like for 1D functions, this still works super well. And you just have this idea, you have this notion that when you study this encoding a lot more, that it's a very multi-scale encoding. So something I like to do in that form is to write the tensors going down to emphasize this. And the idea is that, you know, this is the kind of coarsest scale, um, this is the finest scale. So you find things like that, if you just leave off these, you, you still get a very good approximation. You're just gonna coarsening. Um, so in this, in this way of looking at it, the kind of, that problem you mentioned about the, um, the bits kind of changing very suddenly sometimes, even though you move a small amount on the grid. It doesn't really cause too much of a problem because these, these tensors at the bottom are, are almost like flat functions. So even though the bits will change suddenly, the value doesn't change very much. So if you kind of see what I mean, it's like all these will be set to one and this will be zero and then all of a sudden these will all flip to zero and that'll switch to one. But these are very smooth down here. So it, it, everything just kind of stitches together very nicely. But I think you're onto something about when you start using these to do two-dimensional functions. So how does 2D work in this form? Is this, this becomes X and this becomes Y. So you have X bits and Y bits. It's not like a PEPS, it's like it's just you have two indices on every tensor. 3D is just you have a third index on every tensor. Now you have Z bits. Um, then, um, then it can become more of a problem. So if the function's smooth, it still works great. But if it has like sharp discontinuities and they, they form like a curve or like a circle or something, then the bond dimension can explode. And it might have something to do with this Hamming distance thing or not. I don't know if it's super well understood why it explodes in that case. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah, because yeah. there is this uh, gray code, I think, but it's only curing the nearest neighbors in 1D. There's only the what, sorry? The... Okay, maybe it's a little bit technical, but basically, uh -huh. uh, you can make sure that two consecutive points on a one dimension agreed have Hamming distance one. Oh, okay. But it doesn't work if you take oh, like. Okay. I'd really like to learn about this because I think, in a way, the people doing this right now, the people trying this out, 
are, are only using this kind of base two because it's sort of connecting to quantum information, quantum computing ideas. Like you can, it turns out in this form, the Fourier transform is just the quantum Fourier transform of these, for example, and it's actually also an MPO. So like there's some neat connections. However, um, maybe we're leaving a lot on the table by choosing binary. Maybe we should be using a different thing. So do you, I'd like to hear more about that idea. Mm -hmm. Questions? Uh So oh, yeah, maybe I can do, I can do one question. So uh, you made this uh, connection with the kernel method, so in this high dimension high presentation. So I was wondering if you can use this high dimension high presentation to tell like what are the relevant uh, features of the system, like what are the relevant product of features of the system, of the data yeah. set? That's a good question. Um, so that's, that's exactly where, you know, um, I think tensor networks could bring a lot more interpretability, however, Sometimes when I hear the word interpretability, I mean, I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of competing ideas out there of what interpretability might, might mean or what would be the best thing we would want. Um, and I, I feel like there's still a lot of room for creativity about that. So one idea I could think of off the top of my head would be, I mentioned to you, you can do this like, perfect sampling of a tensor network, right? So the weights here in this form are on top, they're at MPS, I could perfect sample them. So if I wanted to know which weights are big, what are the big ones, I could just start collecting samples from W and just rank them, you know, like, because I can also compute the, the weight when I get the sample. So I could actually just make a plot to see, like, how quickly are they decaying, how high order are the big ones, this kind of thing. Like, that would be, that would be one thing that would be easy to do. But I don't know if that's, like, the best way to analyze it. So I think, I think there's a lot of possibilities about... Um, I think the possibilities for analysis are huge, but I don't think we right now know all the best ways. Um, one of the talks tomorrow, I'll talk about this thing called tensor cross interpolation. That one is really neat, because it's actually a completely new gauge for MPS that people didn't appreciate before in the physics community. It's not based on SVD, it's based on this other type of matrix factorization. And that one, what it does is it tells you something like, out of all the two to the n weights that are in the MPS, that you only need like a very small number of them, it's like chi squared or so, are, are the ones that tell you everything, and the rest are interpolated, and you, have a, you keep a table of all those important ones. So you actually have this running memory of like, these are the important weights that I have to store, and all the other ones are just some linear combination of those. So you actually have really in your hands explicit, like these Ws, the explicit ones. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to follow up on the interpretability kind of explainability issue, mm -hmm. have, have tensor networks been used in a kind of Bayesian setting where distinguishing between aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty become more important? I don't think they have. Um, I think it's something really like worth looking into. So I mean, I don't think I can comment on, I don't know the Bayesian setting very well in terms of like those concepts. I mean, I just know the basic idea about priors and some of this, but the um, one little side comment, probably not to your question, but something that I would be really interested to try is that um, I know a big activity in some of those, some of those fields is to um, you like estimate the posterior using sampling methods a lot. This is a really big activity. There's whole software packages like Stan and things for doing this. Um, one, one kind of theme that's been happening a lot in um, the kind of corner of condensed matter that I sit in and is very kind of popular part of CCQ is the idea of that maybe whenever we see Monte Carlo being used, we could use tensor networks. And this has been getting used a lot more. So there was a whole chain of thought that just recently culminated where some researchers um, were starting up by sampling Feynman diagrams in high dimensional Monte Carlo. Then they said, let's sample kind of groups of Feynman diagrams. Then let's not sample them. Let's use um, pseudo sampling methods where you sample on these kind of pseudo, um, I forgot the name of it, but you do this Monte Carlo with these deterministic points. Um, then they said, why are we doing sampling? We should, we're just doing sums after all. We should use a tensor network. So they use this algorithm I'll show you tomorrow to just machine learn all the Feynman diagrams up to order 30. And so now the Monte Carlo is gone. You just do this machine learning. You get all the Feynman diagrams to order 30, this huge you know, factorial number um, to very high precision. It's kind of crazy. And, um, and so then I'm very curious to know if this could be brought into that area where people are doing all this posterior sampling too. You know, could we do the same tricks over there and then not have to do Monte Carlo? I think it could happen in a big way, possibly. <laughs> 
All right, I think now it's time to close. Uh, so let's thanks again, Myos.